Second bird. D was back in the vacant lot, in the same lot as always. And the grass glistened in the moonlight and swayed in the breeze, just as it had been when he left. Just so you know, that wasn't my doing, said the voice that spilled from Dee's left hand. Ignoring the remark, Dee said, Shall we take a little nap? He must have known it was Sybil that had transported him here from the hospital. The machine keeping her dreams in check was destroyed by Harold's dagger, which Dee threw just before he vanished. A vermilion stain spread across his chest. I suppose we should, his left hand said. Two forces are competing for this world, and both are pretty tough. As a result, the opposition's just going to keep escalating. But enough about that. I guess we should find a better. If you've got to go to sleep, at least after what just happened, you're nice and tired for it. D turned around. His cyborg horse was tethered to a tree not far away. His mount had been transported, too. Watch the place while I'm gone, he said. And with that, he walked over to the nearby grove. Very interesting, his left hand said. Plan on sleeping here, do you? You've got nerve, I'll give you that. And they'll find you here in a second. And the voice sounded almost excited about the proposition, as if the idea of Dee getting killed was so entertaining he could barely contain himself. For Dee, it would be the same no matter where he slept. The whole world was his enemy. But knowing this, he still chose to go back to sleep in the vacant lot, the very first place his foes would think of looking for him. Indeed, he was no ordinary young man. As he lay down, a slight sigh spilled from his thin lips. Most likely it was just his chest wound having its say. Of course, no one else would ever know for sure. Dee's sorrow, his joy, and his pain belonged to him alone. Taking the longsword off his back and setting it down in the bushes to his left, Dee shut his eyes. Immediately, he was enveloped in blue light. He was in the hall of the mansion, and a sad but sweet melody twined around him, and then flowed away. Why had Sybil chosen music so light but so sad? A number of shadowy forms flowed around Dee. The next thing he knew, the figures in the hall had begun to sway. The graceful steps of dreamers, voices humming with laughter, weaving his way through men and women who were like phantoms, Dee came to the center of the hall. All movement stopped. The dancers remained with hands together, chatting guests still held champagne glasses, all of them frozen for eternity in those poses, all except one, Sybil. Saying nothing, Dee stared at the pale girl who stood there quietly. It's about time you finally told me what it is you need, he said. What do you want from me? Please kill. What had she said? Could the words of this pale young lady, the one with these beautiful dreams, have said this? Please kill. Dee's face was reflected in the black of Sybil's peoples. He was cold and beautiful, and completely removed from the deeper emotions. Why don't you just go on dancing like this? The hunter asked. This night will never end. This is what you wanted. He knew that when he bit you. Dee turned his eyes to one of the nearby dancers. The man's face was the color of darkness, while the fangs in his mouth were conspicuous. And his partner was an ordinary woman. It was a dance party for humans and nobility, hand in hand, in a world swimming with kindness and blue light. But what could all this mean? if the noble responsible for this had known about it too. 
Perhaps the one who bit Sybil and made this wish of hers come true had wanted the very same thing. In the end, however, it had come down to this. Please kill. Sybil repeated. Her words were sincere. No anger, no pain, no weariness in them. And that was what she desired from the very bottom of her heart. If you die, he said, it will all fade away. As will this world, and everyone you've made, and everything you eat dream, and everything they've dreamed. The hunter's words were heavy with conviction. Could the young lady truly wish for death if it meant throwing everything away? Kill, she said. Dee turned around to leave. With the hem of her white gown flapping wildly, Sybil dashed out in front of him. Please don't go. Don't leave until you've done it. And that's the whole reason I brought you here. Not even bothering to shake free of her hands, Dee left the hall. Please, Sybil pleaded, tears glistening in her eyes. Dee stopped on the veranda. On the brick path that led to the iron gate, there stood a figure in black, an arrow already notched in his bow. So if I won't kill her, then they'll kill me, Dee muttered. Was that how badly she wanted to die, even though she had the perfect dream? I'm begging you. Giving the girl no reply, Dee went down the stone stairs, and the bow shook slightly. Dee's left hand raced out for the steel arrow, howling through the air. Realizing that the little mouth in his palm had stopped his missile, the figure in black was thoroughly shaken. Using the moment as an opening, Dee made a mad dash. As the shadowy figure kicked off the ground, a deadly thrust stretched toward his torso. The blade went into his chest through his black garments leaving only the jolt of their contact behind. The man leapt back to the iron fence. Dee threw his sword, his beloved blade, a truly frightening move. It pierced the man's heart, went right through him, and didn't stop until it struck one of the iron bars of the gate. Dee looked around. There was no sign of his foe in front of the iron gate. Then Dee saw him behind it, holding the left side of his chest as it dripped bright blood, slowly retreating into the depths of the forest. Removing his sword from the fence, Dee pushed against the gate. With a slavering sound, his left hand sped out the arrow, and the missile fell against the bricks. A chain had been wound around the gate repeatedly, raising his right hand. Dee swung it back down with a particular difficulty. White sparks flew, and the chains dropped off like a lifeless serpent. Please don't go, Sybil said, her voice mingling with the creak of the iron gate. If you won't do it, I'll kill me, Dee said. Kill to destroy. Kill to not be destroyed. That's a human for you, the voice in his left hand muttered. At that moment, pale blue sparks shot from the iron gate. Dee furrowed his brow as purplish smoke and faint groans rose from his left hand as it wrapped around the fence. Don't go, I beg of you. Dee pushed the gate open. All at once the wind buffeted him. The moonlight scattered and the forest wailed. Shredded leaves whirled around Dee like a cyclone. Fine lines of vermilion raced across his pallid cheeks, and the foliage had become razor-sharp fragments of steel that slashed his skin. Like great black wings, the hem of his coat spread, whistling as it dropped again. Every bit of airborne foliage was batted away, and they embedded themselves in the ground. Stop your idle threats said the hunter, if you want to be killed, you'd better try to kill me too. 
but if I did that, Sybil said, her voice borne on the wind. Dee's left hand chuckled with delight. That was an awful thing to say, but at least you're showing your true colors. The left hand then gave a muffled cry of pain as Dee squeezed the melted flesh into a tight fist and walked away. Where do you think you're going? The woman called out. Unless you wake up, you can't get out of here. There's nowhere for you to go. Her voice seemed to follow him forever. No place to go. For D. That made this place no different than anywhere else. Thunder rumbled in the distant sky. Page break. Nan entered the vacant lot. It was a pale moonlit night. Her eyes were incredibly sharp and she just couldn't get to sleep. Her quarrel with Cain was part of it. But at the same time, she was also aware that it wasn't the main reason. As she lay in bed, she couldn't close her eyes without seeing that hunter's face. It rose in her heart just like the pale moon. She'd gone outside to cool her head a bit. As the wind pushed around her, she got an urge to go for a walk. And the next thing she knew, she was on the path that led to the vacant lot. She didn't have the faintest idea why she was going there. On entering the lodge, she immediately spotted Dee leaning back against a tall tree at the edge of the grove with his eyes shut. Jealousy filled her as she surmised that he was probably visiting Sybil's mansion. Muffling her footsteps, she walked over to his side. As the girl gently reached out to touch Dee's shoulder, his eyes opened. Unfathomable in their hue, his eyes gazed at the paralyzed and dumbstruck man. I'm glad you woke me up, he said. Well done. Sure. Nan replied, her eyes wide. She had no way of knowing Dee had been stuck in a dead end in the dream world. What brings you here? You. You're covered in blood. The girl stammered. The wound is healed. But it looks awful. She said. Come to my house. I'll clean it up for you. Just leave it be. Dee said, lightly shutting his eyes. And then he quickly asked, Did you make up with the boy that you were arguing with earlier? Why's that? Nan began, about to tell him it was none of his business. But in the end she merely shook her head. And the gorgeous young man, arrogant and cold-blooded, had suddenly looked so isolated and wary to her. And though she couldn't tell what his hat, boots, and coat were made of, there wasn't a loose thread or a mark on them. But the body they sheltered had no place to call home, and the reality of that hit her painfully hard. Surely this young man hadn't known even one night's peace. Tears filled Nan's eyes as she closed them, trying to chalk her own reaction up to adolescent sentimentality. Wiping away her tears, she opened her eyes again. Dee was looking up at her, and she began to blush. What's wrong? asked Dee. Nothing. Please, don't say anything to scare me. Are you still afraid of me? Nan had no reply. You're the only one who dreamt me. You're the only one who dreamt of me three times. Do you have any idea why? None whatsoever. As Dee's gaze left her, Nan dimmed to look. Ah. Aren't you going to even ask me what I'm doing out here? And though she'd broached the matter timidly enough, Dee didn't answer her. Nan could have cursed herself for asking such a stupid question. I couldn't get to sleep, so I decided to go for a walk. It's not like I went out looking for you or anything. Don't get the wrong idea. While she realized she was just going to end up hurting herself, she couldn't help speaking. She'd probably hate herself in the worst way for it later. It's a lovely night, Dee said suddenly. Quite appropriate for a peaceful village. 
Do you wish it could always be this way? Not fully understanding what he was getting at, Nan nodded anyway. She just felt like she had to. This is where I was born, she said. There's no place quite as nice. Ever thought about leaving? Nan shook off the moonlight. You mean to go to some distant village? She asked. Sure, I'd like to go. But I don't know what I'd find there. That scares me. How about your boyfriend? You mean Cain? Give him another year and I'm sure he'll zip out of the village like an eagle freed from a snare. All the boys are like that. They're not the least bit afraid of the unknown. Or maybe they go because they're afraid. Out on the frontier, there weren't all that many young men who left their home villages. For villages that relied solely on local industries to support themselves. Young people were an irreplaceable labor force. More precious than anything. Because the young men and women themselves understood this, the vast majority of them were destined to reach maturity, grow old, and go to their eternal reward all in the same village. Still, there were some young people who set out seeking the world beyond their village. While the ones that remained at home kept their love of unexplored territory burning deep in their hearts, with all the fire of a youth's feverish imaginings. How about Sybil? Dee asked, his voice stirred the moonlight. A strange turmoil engulfed Nan, her lips trembling. She said the name of the dreamer. Why did Dee ask her such a thing when she'd never known her as anything but a slumbering princess? I don't know, Nan replied, not surprisingly. But... D watched the girl quietly. But I think a girl like her would just stay here and pass her whole life in the village, even if she wanted to go somewhere else. And if her own children wanted to leave, it would bother her. But she'd keep her peace and watch them go. And after all, what she wanted more than anything was a peaceful village. Compared to other places, this village has a lot more young people who leave. Do you folks ever hear from them? Yeah, sure, Nan said, nodding firmly. It was almost guaranteed that the young birds who left the nest would send money and letters back to their families. On very rare occasions, when the parents wished to see their children living in distant lands, back they came, as if they knew of their family's desires. D listen, not saying a word. Somehow Nan got the feeling he might be bidding this world farewell. But she quickly discounted that notion. He wasn't the kind of person who'd have anything to do with sentiment. I kind of get the feeling I know why she called you here, Nan said. Even she was startled by how smoothly the words came out. Mind if I tell you? Go ahead. Because you don't have any connection to this village or our world. I don't know why that'd be important. I just think it's the reason she chose you. Because you're someone who won't be moved by the joy or grief Sybil feels while she sleeps, or by the hopes and despairs of our world. You come, you go. That's the kind of person you are. And once she finished speaking, she had the feeling it hadn't been a nice thing to say, but Dee didn't seem to mind in the least. He just kept staring straight ahead. As she gazed at his perfect profile, Nan felt a fire she'd never really known before welling up in her heart. And while she was fully aware he wasn't the kind of person who got involved with others, that made her feel all the more like she wanted him to be someone special. And she wanted him to feel the same way about her. She'd seen Dee more than anyone else in the village had, after all. This thought rose from the deepest reaches of Nan's psyche, easily weaving its way through the safeguards of rationality before it moved the girl's hand. Another thought, a different thought. The girl's fingers touched Dee's shoulder. Somewhere inside her an image of Cain may have remained, but it swiftly vanished. Dee, Nan said to him, this is probably the last time I'll ever see you. She had no proof of that, 
but it just felt so incredibly true. Nan quietly brought her cheek to rest on a powerful shoulder that spoke volumes about how solid he was. It was the only thing she could do. Even though she'd seen his face in her dreams three nights more than the rest of the villagers. Dee didn't say a thing. At least Cain would have hugged her to his chest and stroked her hair. Dee, Nan said, not expecting anything, but still wanting something nonetheless. Once more she called his name, and it was then that she was pushed away, and the hunter rose with such speed he whipped up a black wind. Stand back, was all he said, bringing cruelly as the crack of a whip, and the words drifted off into the forest as Nan and Dee both turned their gaze in the same direction. Papa, and the girl cried out reflexively, when she saw what was clearly her father, at the entrance to the vacant lot. And it wasn't just him. Mama and Kane, too. Perhaps the three figures had heard her voice because they looked at each other and hastened closer. Nan, what in blazes are you doing in a place like this? Her father shouted. But the girl averted her face from his admonishment. We looked in on your bed and found you gone. And Kane was so worried... He came along too, Nan's mother said, driving the girl's spirits even lower. I suppose you're going to tell us you didn't lure her out here, eh? Kane spat, his fiery words prompting all to turn in his direction. Dee was in front of the boy. The hunter stood a head taller than him, though the other man was like a massive wall before him. Nan's boyfriend focused every bit of defiance he could muster on the hunter. Cain, he had nothing to do with it, Nan protested. I came up here on my own, I'll have you know. I couldn't get to sleep. Now you listen to me, the boy said, thrusting a trembling finger at Dee. Me and Nan are going to get married one of these days. I don't take kindly to some lousy wanderer coming in and dirtying her up. Cain, quit it. I don't recall promising you any such thing. Hush, Nan, her mother said in an attempt to stop her. At any rate, if nothing's happened, then we're fine. Come on, let's go home. And I'll thank you not to come nosing around these parts again, the girl's father said as he glared at Dee. I just can't walk away, Cain said, shaking his head. Someone takes my girl out in the middle of the night, and you think I'm going to just let that go? Duel me. Nan felt like she'd been paralyzed. What did you say? She shouted. Stop it, King. But it was the next word she heard that made her hair stand on Nan. Fine. Let's do it. Nan. Dee replied. Dumbfounded, Nan turned to her father. Stern as ever, his expression plastered a look of ghastly terror on his daughter's face. Papa? She exclaimed. It's no use. Come with me, Nan's mother said, grabbing hold of the girl's shoulders and dragging her back. Even her mother was going along with this. She watched as her father said here, and handed Cain an axe. Just as he took it, Cain backed away a few steps, and Nan's father stepped back too. Dee stood still, completely forgetting to put up any kind of struggle against her mother. Nan was rooted to the spot. What was happening was so hard to believe that she thought it might be a nightmare. At that moment, there was a weirdly colored explosion of light inside her head. This is a nightmare. A dream. I'm... A weird cry brought the girl's eyes around in Dee's direction. Cain had brought his axe down. It whined through the air. Though it didn't look like he'd done anything at all, Dee had smoothly moved over to the grass. The air was crushed with a heavy whoosh. In the very instant, a horizontal flash seemed to be swallowed by the hunter's black torso. A streak of silver shot up from below, causing Cain's hand and the axe of grip to vanish. Nan held her breath, 
D watched silently as Kane collapsed backward with a cry like a beast. Behind the hunter, another figure was drawing closer. Papa, the girl exclaimed, but her cry wasn't as fast as the sword that pierced her father's chest as he was about to pounce. Slumping across his back, the girl's father let the machete he'd hidden fall from his hand, and a cry of pain spilled from his mouth. By the time he hit the ground, he was already dead. Papa! How could you do such a thing? Flicking the gore from his blade with a single shake, Dee headed to his horse without saying a word. I don't want to kill. But I can't die just yet either, he finally said. And then his words were all that remained in the night air. As Nan stood there frozen in her mother's arms, her brain incapable of forming even a single thought, she heard the sound of dwindling hoofbeats ringing in her ear. Second part, end.